words of joy and hope. It is the 10th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year A, and the readings is from Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13, and the commentary is by Father Fernando Armelini. A good Sunday to all. If you hate the sinner, it means that you love sin, because you consider it an asset on which a rival, more enterprising and unprejudiced of you, throws himself in advance. From this unacknowledged jealousy, intolerance, fanaticism, and the image of an executioner God in charge of restoring fairness with rewards and punishments are born. Whoever hates sin avoids it like a disease, like leprosy, but loves the sinner, surrounding him with attention and care because he has, he is convinced that he is or she is an unfortunate person in need of understanding and help. It is difficult to let the righteous accept the idea of a banquet freely laden by God for all peoples, Isaiah 25, 25.6. It is hard to make them sit at dinners next to those who have not merited the invitation to the feast. So the righteous introduce competition even in their relationship with God. They consider others as harassing competitors who, without right, are grabbing the blessings and predilections of God. The publican was sitting at the tax office when Jesus called him. He was one of those excluded. According to Luke, he was called Levi, Luke 5.27. He was Levi, son of Alpheus, says Mark 2.14. In today's Gospel, he is called Matthew. The change of name is surprising. The explanation that has garnered more support is that, like Simon Peter, this man had also two names, Levi, the name given by the parents, of, and Matthew, attributed to him afterwards. We are interested in this second name. It means a gift of the Lord. It is unbelievable. Levi, the public sinner, infamous and despised, is a gift from the Lord. To reject him, to exclude him from the banquet, would be a loss for all diners. Let us now listen to the Gospel of today. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what it means I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And to hear the words of the Gospel. The call of Levi is not told to inform us about the circumstances in which it occurred, but to convey a message that applies to every disciple. The scene described clearly follows the calling of the first four disciples. That was in Matthew 4, 18-22. Jesus is on his ways, sees someone attempting to do his job. He offers him the invitation to follow him. He abandons everything he was doing and follows him. The call of Levi differs from that of Peter, Andrew, James and John. For a significant detail, the profession is not simple, but an honorable one. 
is not a fisherman. It's a tax collector. It is a job that makes one unpopular to the people, not only because nobody likes to pay taxes, but because the tax collector is considered an unclean person, a collaborator of the oppressive state structure, and also a thief. His salvation was considered virtually impossible. In fact, the law states that those who stole must return the stolen goods plus 20%. How could a tax collector fulfill this condition even if he knows how and from whom he stole? The first message of the parable is capturing this recall of the infamous profession. The evangelist will show who are the people whom Jesus invites to follow him. The rabbis did not admit among their disciples infamous people, sinners, the poor of the earth, the shepherds, the lepers, those whom they do not entertain any relationship. It is to these infamous people that Jesus addressed his invitation. He does not call those who deserve it, who are well disposed of, the spiritually prepared, but those in need of salvation. The calling of Levi curiously resembles the healing of the paralytic that the evangelist has just told. Levi is not motionless on a bed, but is sitting at the tax collector's chair. His eyes are fixed on the money and on the records, and no force seems able to move him. No human words are able to make him stand. The look and the word of Jesus instead get what no one would have dared to imagine. As soon as he hears the call of the master, Matthew jumps up and follows him. Just like the paralytic, he walks towards his home, where he finds laden a big dinner. The miracle occurred. The camel passed through the eye of the needle. The rich entered the kingdom of heaven. What was impossible for people was realized by God. Matthew 19, 23-26 Why did Jesus call Levi? Where is he leading him? The second part of the passage answers this question. He invited him to a feast. To call sinners does not mean to rebuke, reproach the moral misery in which they fail, humiliate them, remind them to observe their duties and precepts, but, first of all, to announce to them that they are awaited in the room where the feast is laden. They might have experienced every form of pleasure, but have never tasted joy. It is now in the joy of the kingdom of God that Jesus wants them to be introduced, to introduce them because the kingdom of God is joy. In which house is the feast takes place? Luke expressly states that it was organized in the house of Levi where for the occasion he convened a crowd of his colleagues. That is in Luke 5.29. A different version of Matthew says while he was at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples. Mark is more explicit. While he was at table in his house, Mark 2.15. It is therefore not in the house of the neo-apostle that many tax collectors and sinners came and take place, but in the house of Jesus. This explains better the indignation of the Pharisees, who blame the master who receives sinners and eats with them. They blame him because he acts as a friend of the publicans and sinners. The reference here is not so much the material house, but the community. This is the house where Jesus accepts all sinners. Gestures, we know, are often more expressive than words. Eating and drinking satisfy the biological needs, but sitting at table with someone is not to appease their hunger and thirst, but is a sign of intimacy and communion. 
This is why in the early Christian communities, the observant Jews refused to sit at table with their fellow believers from paganism. Peter also for a time was hesitant. First, he ate with the Gentiles, but then he withdrew and did not mingle anymore with them for fear to the Jewish group, as Galatians 2.12 says. The provocative behavior of Jesus eating with tax collectors could not be immediately understood and accepted. It was a surprise for every pious Israelite, brought up to the expectation of the feast of the kingdom of God reserved for the righteous, for the pious. Though this observation leads us to the third part of, the, of, the, of this passage of today, which are the verses 11 and ter, to 13, which describes the inevitable dispute with the Pharisees. Before, whenever Jesus breaks the rules, they just react. What irritates them in his behavior? Certainly not the attempt to lead the sinners to repentance and conversion. If it were only for this, the Pharisees who travel the land and sea to make one proselyte, at 23.15, would appreciate his zeal and congratulate him. Jesus' gesture contains an explosive message for the Jewish mentality. He offers salvation to all, not only to the righteous. His answer to criticism is articulated in three adamant sentences that do not allow replication. He primarily quotes an ancient proverb, not without a subtle irony. Healthy people do not need a doctor, but sick people do. Then he introduces a biblical quote which is perhaps the most revolutionary of all the gospel. What I want is mercy, not sacrifice. Finally, he summarizes his choice with this phrase, I have not come to call the just, but the sinner to a change of heart. The mistake of the Pharisees, whose names actually mean separated, holy, is to imagine that the Holy God does not want to have anything to do with sinners. They think that imitate him by holding themselves too distant from those who neglect God's law, or even worse, deny the Lord. With his attitude, Jesus says that God does not accept such discrimination. Undoubtedly, the Christian community has a duty to present the gospel in an integral manner and cannot do discounts on what Jesus taught. It is the right of the Christian community to also point out to those who cannot bring themselves to follow Christ that certain choices put them outside the community and the kingdom of God. However, we have to ask whether it is appropriate for someone to be legally ousted the danger of extinguishing the smoldering wick is always serious, and it is a risk that better not take place. I wish you all a good Sunday and a good week.